want you to clap your hands. If you've been walking the same old road for miles and miles If you've been hearing the same old voice to the same old lies If you're trying to feel the same old holes inside There's a better life There's a better life If you've got pain if you feel lost, he's a way maker. If you need freedom and saving, he's a prison shaking savior. If you got chains, he's a chain breaker. Clap your hands with us, good. We've all searched for the night of the day in the dead of night. 
we've all found ourselves worn out from the same old fire. We've all run the things we know just ain't right. Yes, we have. With a better life, he's got a better life. There's a better life. Sing with me. If you got the pain, he's a pain taker. If you feel lost, he's a way maker. If you need freedom, a saving, he's a prison shaking savior. If you got chains, he's a chain breaker. If you believe it, if you receive it. Somebody testify. If you believe, if you receive it, you can feel it. Somebody testify, testify. You believe it, if you receive it, you can feel it. Somebody testify. victory in the Lord Jesus. And he set us free. He set us free to be the church of Jesus Christ, to be his hands and feet. We are. Let's sing that great song together.
name. Let's pray. Lord, you've called us to be the light. And you've given us light. So let us just shine for you. Let, when people see our church, our ministry, and us, let them see you. In Jesus' name we pray. Let it be Jesus. The first name that I call. Let it be Jesus. that thought. Spend a moment with the Lord. Let him hear from you what that means. Yeah. 
when we're facing opposition, if we're surrounded, Lord, let them see you in us. When things are going well and maybe when things are at their worst, Lord, let the world see you in us. And the church does face opposition. We've seen that happen this very week in the state of Texas. And the best, you know, the church is at its best when she's on her knees, when Praying before the Lord, the God who has all the solutions and the problems. Let him catch our tears. So we will be praying this morning. And uh, loss is not confined to places other than our own homes and our own place. And so we want to recognize that we lost you know, one of, one of very, our, our very own Patricia Winchester and had a beautiful, beautiful memorial service for her here, here on Thursday. What a great time that was. So. We're going to pray for these families that are grieving. And you may have come today and you thought, wow, I'm grieving. I need prayer. So in the presence of the Lord, knowing that he's here and knowing that he's just simply wanting to comfort and to move, let's bring these things before him right where we're standing. Father, we thank you for being here and for loving us and for caring for us. And Lord, there's been such great loss in our nation of late. Such great pain, such great questions that we don't have the answers for. And yet, Lord, we don't know what to do, but we know you, and we know you do. So, Lord, we lift up those that are still suffering from gunshot wounds and, and grief and tragedy in San Antonio and other places that we may not have even heard of yet. And for the Winchester family, we pray that you would provide comfort in a time of loss and need. And all over this place, and those watching us online, Lord, wherever there's needs, Lord, we lift them up in the name of Jesus. That not just that they would be met, for we know you, you move. Sometimes you say yes, sometimes you know that you say no. But we would draw near to you, the great giver of life. Not that we know we can place our hope in you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. I want to invite you to take the connection card in the seat pocket in front of you, and there's a particular reason to do so today. And uh, guys, we're gonna take the offering in a minute. I'm just gonna keep going here with my announcements. So the connection card is a place where you can communicate, and we do wanna communicate with you because stuff like the Crossroads update is a, is a thing that we use when we've lost someone in our family, in our church family. So we sent out this email saying, you know, this person has, has died, and these are the, the, these are the, the funeral arrangements, memorial service, and stuff. And you may not be on that list. So if you want to be on this crossroads, up list, uh, crossroads Update list, take that connection card and just write Crossroads Update on it. And that way you can get on that. And uh, the connection card is also a great place for you to let us know that you're here, ask any questions, and indicate prayer requests. We are a praying church, and we believe that God answers prayer. And we want to pray with you. That's a great way to do it. So as the offering plate comes by, go ahead and put it in. And uh, this opportunity to connect with God and others comes as a result of God's invitation for us to be faithful and his partnership with us. So I want to encourage you to give today. If you've given online already, wonderful. And uh, if you're not sure whether you can afford it or not, let me encourage you to just go ahead and give at, out of your need. And God is an amazing and wonderful God and does things that we had no idea that he was going to do financially for us. So just let me encourage you to do that. Let's pray again. Father, we thank you for this offering, and we thank you for the opportunity to give and, uh, and use these gifts for your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
On Sunday, November 19th, we will gather to celebrate our third family night of Thanksgiving. Everyone is invited to this evening of singing, praying, and giving to our community. Check out what this handsome guy has to say about it. My name is Scott Sigler, and I am chairman of the Deacon's Ministry at Celebration Baptist Church. The Family Night of Thanksgiving is a great opportunity for our entire church congregation to come together in prayer and in worship and also gather and help serve our community as a whole. Over the past few years, we've been able to grow the number of families that we've been serving. This year, our objective is to meet 100 families in Leon County. Our church can help with this. There are a number of ways that people can give. First, they can pick up a grocery list and purchase the groceries that will be delivered to those families. Second, they can be part of the group that's actually going to pick up the turkeys and pies to go with those groceries. Also, we'll have a group that will be preparing those groceries, putting them together with the turkeys, boxing them up, and preparing them for delivery. And then last, we'll actually have the drivers that will go out into the community and deliver those meals to those families. And this will all happen leading up to the family night of Thanksgiving, and then we will make those deliveries immediately following the service on that evening. The family night of Thanksgiving has been very rewarding. It's a great opportunity for us as a church to come together and give thanks for our many blessings, and at the same time, meet the needs of our community and engage with our community. Now that guy knows what he's talking about. Family night of Thanksgiving will start at 5 p.m but the prayer and worship service is only part of what makes this night so special. Visit the Season of Compassion table on the runway today. Pick up a shopping list and help provide Thanksgiving dinner for a family in need. Check out today's takeaway for more information on Family Night of Thanksgiving and all the other components of Celebration's Season of Compassion. Well, good morning. Great to see everybody. Glad that you're here. My name is David Emmert. I'm one of the pastors here at Celebration. and hope you've had a, a very good morning of worship already. We're going to spend some time in the Word. In fact, today we're going to be wrapping up a sermon series that we've entitled Stranger in My Own Home. It's a look at the book of First Peter. And First Peter was written by a guy named Peter to uh, church, churches and church members scattered all, all over the Roman Empire. And they were suffering terribly because of the fact that they'd accepted Jesus Christ. Their acceptance of Jesus changed them so radically, they became strangers in their own home. And it opened up the door for a lot of persecution, a lot of hardship, a lot of difficulty for them. And uh, Peter writes to them to help them know how to manage it and what they ought to do about it. So one of the things that he says to them is, look, you know, uh, you, not, you've got to submit to the government authorities that are around you, folks at work, uh, in your homes there needs to be submission. He goes into that whole thing. He talks about the value of pressing forward uh, and making sure that we're people of righteousness. And today he's going to kind of open up as we look at this last chapter, chapter 5, this last frontier of what it means to live successfully in a world that really comes against us pretty hard as believers. So go ahead and open your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 5 if you haven't already done so. If you need a Bible today, the row in front of you beneath the seat, you'll find a Bible down there. Take that one out and open it up to 1 Peter chapter 5. Let's pray and then we're going to dig right on in. Father, we love you and we are looking forward to this time in the Word uh, together today. Help us to understand what you're saying to us. We love the Word. We know that it's true, and we know that we should base our life on it. We also ask that you just give us the next few minutes to be able to concentrate, free from distraction, to be really pay attention and dial into what you're saying to us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I want you to think about one quality, one trait, one personality trait, that can destroy, blow up relationships faster than any other single thing. In fact, the same trait also can prevent new relationships from forming. It will kill relationships before they even get started. Think about it. Think about what it might be. Got one in mind? All right, the one that I want to talk to you today that came to my mind is pride, right? Pride blows up relationships. It's just like, it's like a nuclear weapon inside of a relationship. It will wipe you out. And when you meet somebody who's really an arrogant person, 
uh, and you're, you're around them, your first reaction to them is, oh, I don't need any of this. I don't need this relationship. It will stop a relationship in its tracks from forming. Now, next Sunday uh, is sort of the beginning of uh, the holiday season. We're having our family night of Thanksgiving. The season of compassion all kicks off next, uh, next Sunday. Can you believe it's the Sunday before Thanksgiving? And we're going to be traveling to family. Family are going to be coming to us. And then, of course, you know, just a few weeks later is Christmas and all of that. And right now, in your mind, some of you already have relatives in mind that when you think about pride or arrogance, you're already dreading seeing them over the holidays, right? You know who they are. I mean, you already, you already got it formed right there in your brain. Because you know that when you're around them, all it's going to be is a nonstop, just deluge of all the accolades they've received since the last time you were around them. And if there were any failings or shortcomings, you're going to get hit with one excuse after the other about why it wasn't their fault that it didn't work out. And you know who I'm talking about. You're just so excited for the holidays to get here so that you can be around that particular relative. Arrogance, pride, absolutely grates your nerves. And Peter knows this. And so as he picks up with this idea, as he's wrapping up this letter to the church scattered all over Rome that's suffering so terribly, and he's talking to them about persecution and all of that, he writes to them and he says, listen, you all, I want you to understand, pride will undermine you. It will blow you up. And I want you to embrace, instead of pride, this whole idea of humility. I want you to grow in your humility. Now, when you first think about this idea of growing in your humility, it seems kind of counterintuitive. I mean, we typically think that either a person is humble or they're not, and that there's really nothing you can do about it. If you're cocky and arrogant, you're just going to be cocky and arrogant till the day you die. And if you happen to be one of those people that God chose to bless with humility, well, blessings on you, right? Then you just go out and people think you're wonderful. But we can't really move from one to the other. Well, that's actually not true. The Bible calls on us to grow in our humility, and that's exactly what Peter's going to talk to us about today. 1 Peter chapter 5, it says this, All of you clothe yourselves with humility toward one another, because God resists the proud. He says, I want you to take humility, and I want you to put it on like clothing every morning when you get up. Now, I don't know about you, but when I get ready to pick out my clothes, I do that at night before I go to bed, because first thing in the morning, all of my brain cells are just not firing very actively, right? And if I were to pick out my clothes first thing in the morning, there's no telling what I would show up at work dressed like. It would be ugly. It would be mismatched. It would, it would be bad, okay? So I make sure I get that done at night. But it, I always make sure when I get up, I pick out my clothes. There it is. They're all ready to go. And then I put them on. I wear my clothes to protect me from the elements, right? It's a little chilly outside, so I'm wearing a long sleeve and all that kind of thing because of that. And then also, there are things about me that you just don't need to see, okay? I mean, maybe you go to Walmart and you see that person in that unfortunate top, right? And you're like, you know, maybe before you left today, a little more clothing might have been a good idea because there are things about you that no one else needs to, it just, it doesn't even need to be in their imagination, right? A little more clothing would have helped you, right? You put on clothing to protect you. You put on clothing to cover up those things that just aren't for everybody, now, Peter says, listen, I want you to put on humility. I want you to clothe yourself with it. I want you to cover up the things that are, frankly, wrong with you. I want you to cover that with humility and make sure that you wear it. My wife is uh, four foot 11 and a half. She will tell you she's five feet. She's not. She's four foot 11 and a half. And for good reason, she wears high heels. Okay, right? I understand. And so I see my wife in high heels. And every time I see her in high heels, I'm thinking, there's a good reason guys never wear shoes like that. That's what I'm thinking, right? And I'll ask her, how in the world do you walk in those things without just killing yourself? Because if I wore high heels, it would be over. I would not even make it out of the bedroom before I hit the deck. I, ladies, I don't know how in the world you do it. And so I asked Pam, how do you wear those shoes? And she will say to me, you just get used to it, right? Now, Peter says, I want you to clothe yourself in humility. And when you first begin to do this, you think, this does not fit me. 
Why am I going to wear something this uncomfortable and this out of place? Because the more often I wear it, the more I'm going to acclimate to it. But I'm wondering, why do I want to wear something i got to get used to? It's like eating a food that's an acquired taste. Why would I want to do this? Well, Peter tells me right here, because God resists the proud. I'm going to put on humility because God is going to resist me if I don't. Now think about that for a second. Uh, There are people on this earth that under certain circumstances I would not want opposing me. For example, I would not go and get involved in a one-on-one basketball game against LeBron James, okay? Now some of you are thinking, but that would be a sweet autograph, Dave. You probably ought to consider it. Do I really want to go into the basketball court with that guy? I mean, there is nobody on earth right now that could take him one-on-one consistently. He's considered the best basketball player alive. I don't need that, okay? I don't want to try to run the ball against Khalil Mack either, okay? I just don't. Life is too short and too precious. I like my joints and limbs too much to attempt to do that. Why would I want to do that? I don't want him opposing me if I'm on the other team. I don't want to go to an auction and look across the room and see Bill Gates sitting over there, okay? I just don't want to do that. He's sitting there in this picture right next to a manuscript by Leonardo da Vinci. He bought it in 2013 for $30 million. He was asked, why did you spend $30 million on a Da Vinci manuscript? He said, because it inspired me. I have never been $30 million of inspired ever in my life, okay? So if I go to an auction, I don't want to see Bill Gates sitting in the room because, yeah, I know, it's over before it even starts. Now, think about this. Why, then, would you want God Almighty himself opposing you? Because Peter says that's what happens to the proud. God is coming up next to you, and he's saying, hey, listen, David, I want you to understand, I oppose your plan. I oppose your agenda. I oppose the course you set your life on, and I'm going to oppose you because of your arrogance. Do you need that? Can you afford that? I can't afford it. I don't need that especially when you begin to realize what the Bible says about how God views those who are humble, all right? Take a look at that in the the next part of verse 5. But God gives grace to the humble. So he opposes the proud, but when it comes to the humble, he's pouring his favor out on them. He's surprising them with blessing. blessing. He's making their path smooth, and, and he's intervening on their behalf. He's opening doors for them. Now, when I know how God responds to the humble, because the verse tells me here exactly how he relates to them, when I know how God relates to the humble, why on earth would I persist in being arrogant? It just doesn't make any sense at all. I mean, frankly, Frankly, it's just foolish. So Peter comes to us. He says, listen, I want you to clothe yourself in humility. And when I read that, I'm wondering to myself, is that even possible? Well, Peter clearly believed so. He thought it was possible for us to grow in our humility. I think part of our problem with humility is that we don't really understand what it is, okay? Humility is simply not thinking little of yourself. Being humble doesn't mean that you have no self-esteem. We often think that it does. We often think that if a person is sitting in the corner, unwilling to speak to anyone, very dialed into his own world and very much in his own head, that that must be a humble person. But that's not it at all. The Bible teaches us that to be humble means that you have a realistic understanding of who you really are, that you get your gifts, your talents, your abilities, you understand all of that, and you've got a realistic assessment of it. Take a look at what he says in Romans uh, chapter 12, verse 3. I tell everyone among you not to think of himself more highly than he should think. Instead, think sensibly. So the Bible is telling us here, hey, in order to be humble, I have to have a realistic assessment of who I am. I know my gifts. I know my abilities. I know my strengths. I understand that God has given me these things. I'm putting them to work for his glory and for his kingdom. And there are certain things that I do well. A humble person can make that assessment. A humble person, though, also can look at themselves and say, I also know my weaknesses, my shortcomings, my failings. A humble person is able to say, you know, that interaction that I was just involved with with that person, that didn't go very well. I should have handled myself better. 
In fact, the way that I handled that interaction, it was downright sinful. I need to repent of that. I need to go and apologize for that. A humble person is able to understand and get their arms around their own failures. They're not afraid to own them. They don't need a PR person out there convincing everybody how great they are in spite of what just happened. They can own it. So a humble person is a person that can, um, you know, walk into a banquet and be on the back row and no problem. That same humble person can also be at the head table receiving the award, right? A humble person is someone who can receive criticism and can also take a compliment. They are smart enough to know that anything that goes well happened because a lot of people worked on it and they want to share that joy with everyone involved. And they're also sharp enough to know that the buck stops here and I'm responsible when things don't go well. Humility is about having an honest self-assessment about who you are. So how do we grow in this honesty? How do we develop this sense of humility? Well, Peter's gonna tell us how. Look at what he says. He says in verse six, humble yourselves therefore under, therefore under the mighty hand of God so that he may exalt you at the proper time, casting all your care on him because he cares about you. So Peter says, okay, step number one in growing in humility is to humble yourself before God and to seek to bring your entire life under his control. Now, when I say that out loud, to me, it sounds kind of churchy. So how do we take that and make it just absolutely practical? I want you to think back over your life, over the last 48 hours or so, and think about some of the things that you did. All right, for example, uh, in the last 48 hours, I went to my online banking account and I opened it up. I find it helpful to have an honest assessment about whether or not I'm broke, right? I don't know about you all, but I like to know, is there money in the bank still? You know, I mean, I just find that a, that's helpful information, right? So I pop open my online bank account and I'm, and I'm confronted with the numbers, the news, good and bad. There it all is before me. When you do that, do you have enough wherewithal to stop and say, Lord, I want to make sure that I'm honoring you with the numbers that I see on the screen in front of me right now. So Lord, as I look at these numbers, show me where there needs to be a little more of your leadership and a little less of mine. Am I reflecting a follower of Christ by the numbers that I see on that screen? Maybe over the last 48 hours, you've had some interactions with your family, your wife, your husband, your children, your parents, and hopefully all those interactions were just awesome. Maybe one or two of them, maybe all of them, weren't so awesome. Have you taken an honest self-assessment and have you thought, you know what, Lord, when I spoke to my wife, I was, it was all about me. That was arrogance talking. I was so concerned about getting my own needs met that I didn't handle that interaction very well at all. I blew it. Help me, Lord, to humble myself, go seek their forgiveness, and to move on and get this right. Think back to the last time that you were at work. Maybe there's uh, you and a coworker, and you're both in line for the same promotion. Maybe you're both in line for, you know, the same pay raise. And so what you've been doing along the way is you've been slipping in just a little bit of snark anytime their name comes up because you're trying to undermine them because you know if their star burns a little more dimly, yours burns a little more brightly. So you've been just tweaking those conversations just a little bit so that you're positioned to be ahead of the pack. Have you stopped and said, you know what, Lord, that's wrong. I don't need to be doing that. You have say in your word that you will exalt me at the right time. I don't need to be out there promoting myself and exalting myself. I need to humble myself and trust that you care about me. So I'm gonna back off of that. I'm gonna handle this differently. You see, you need to build in those opportunities where every single day you're having that moment of a gut check and you make sure that what you're doing is on target. Um, we just moved into our new offices over here in, in this building. And if you've not been by the new church offices, I want to invite you to come and check it out. It's a neat place. And I also wanted to say thank you for making it possible. Your faithfulness has made it possible for us to enjoy those fantastic offices. It's an incredible space. It reflects really well in church. 
Thank you very much for what you've done there. I really appreciate it. So several months ago, we're working with the architect, and he says to me, David, there's a header space above where the offices are going to be, and in that header space, it's a perfect environment for you to put the core values of the organization. So do you have any idea of anything that you'd like to be there? And without any hesitation, I said, oh, yeah, I know exactly what I want there. I want the fruit of the Spirit there. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. That ought to be the core value of our workplace, and so that's what I want on that header. So sure enough, we built the offices, and there they are. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, you get the idea, on, around the office. These got put up just a few days ago, really, and so we're really enjoying having that as a reminder in our office. So uh, if you look at this, I'm right under kindness. Kindness. I've got the kindness office, okay? And when I walked in and saw how it laid out, I knew it was coming, but when I saw how it laid out, I was like, that's ah, perfect, right? <laughs> I couldn't get the joy office, right? Joy office, how easy is that? Hey, I'm just happy all the time. I'm just joyful. You know, no, I got to get the kindness office, right? I got to be kind. So every time I walk into my office, I'm reminded kindness, kindness kindness. Now remember, I wanted the fruit of the Spirit over all of those offices so that it would be a daily reminder, a daily gut check, right? So last week, I come across somebody that I haven't seen in a very long time, and years ago when I encountered this person, I'm going to be blunt, they really hurt me, and you know, I have to work at not grinding an axe. Any of you all that way? You know, and so here I am, I'm around this person, I haven't seen them in a very long time, they hurt me really bad, and so I'm around them, and I am doing everything I can to be polite, okay? So I'm grunting out politeness through clenched teeth, right? And I'm being polite to this person. On the inside, I'm going, ah, 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 ah. you know, that's what's going on on the inside, right? And then I walk back into our office, and I make my way to the kindness corner where my office is. And I have to stop. And I have to confess. You know what, Lord? I did not treat that person like a child of the king. I did not treat that person like my brother or my sister. I didn't get that right. Lord, I have to humble myself before you and I have to confess that I didn't get that done right. And let me just ask you, think about the last 48 hours. Do you have built into your life a systematic way to humble yourself before the Lord and to take yourself through that little gut check so you can say, this interaction, this part of my life, I've submitted it to God's control. Because if you haven't done that, if you're not doing that, then you're missing the boat on what Peter says is essential if you're ever going to get this whole humility thing right. You got to do it. When you help yourself before God, verse 7 says, an amazing things happen, a beautiful thing happens. All of our anxieties, all of our cares are laid on his shoulders, right? Some of you all are really anxious right now. You're worried about your promotion or your workplace. You're worried about your marriage. Will I ever be fulfilled in this relationship? You're worried about your grades at school. Will, I ever, will they ever be high enough? And you're on this constant quest of self-promotion, right? Because you're, you're thinking that if you don't do that, if you don't grind into this, that somehow life's going to pass you by. And Peter says, listen, instead of doing that, just trust the fact that God will exalt you at the right time. You can lay all of that on top of his shoulders and let him carry that for you. You don't need to worry about exalting yourself or promoting yourself or being arrogant or prideful because God promises to have your back. And one way or another, in this life or the next, he will exalt you at the right time. You want to become greater in your humility? Humble yourself before the Lord. Now, Peter goes on. He gives us another step in this important process, beginning in verse 8. 
He says, be serious. Be alert. Your adversary, the devil, is prowling around like a roaring lion, looking for anyone he can devour. Resist him and be firm in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are being experienced by your fellow believers throughout the world. So Peter says, listen, another critical step in this journey toward being and experiencing greater humility is for you to be aware about the evil one, the fact that he's trying to come at you. You've got to stay alert. So my son calls me up this week, and he says, hey, I'm coming home this weekend. Awesome news, right? It's a long weekend because of uh, the holiday on Friday. He doesn't have classes that day, and so he's going to come home. I'm very excited about that. And he says he's going to come home Thursday after class. He's going to leave, and he's going to come home you know, that evening. So I'm very excited about seeing him. It's always great when your kid comes home from college. So Pam and I are at home on Wednesday night after church, and we're just relaxing, just hanging out. Dogs are, you know, dead to the world, you know, you know how dogs are at, you know, in the evening. At least our dogs are all piled up, you know, and they're snoring away. And we're just relaxing, watching a little TV, you know, getting ready to go to bed. And uh, we hear this noise, someone's coming in the house in our back door at, you know, 10 o'clock at night. Well, Pam hears it, and she looks at me, and she does the whisper. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Someone's coming into our house, because nobody can hear that, right? Okay? And then she jumps up. The dogs jump up. They all dog, you know, you know, and they're charging around the corner, going down the hallway toward our back door. You can't see our back door from our living room. And Pam jumps up, and instead of going to see who it is, she goes into the kitchen and she gets behind the bar in the kitchen, and she's like this, you know? And I'm looking at her like, really? Okay. Well, the dogs are barking, but as soon as they go around the corner to see the back door, they stop. And I can see the, you know, the dog's tails, and both of them just, just, they're just wagging 100 miles an hour. It's clear they've encountered someone they know, and I put two and two together that Dean Emmert has decided to declare a Thursday an additional holiday, and he's come home you know, one day early. So I walk around the corner, and sure enough, there's CJ, home on Wednesday night. I hug him. I'm glad to see him. Welcome him home. We walk into the kitchen, and Pam is doing this number, coming out from behind the bar of the kitchen. And I don't say anything because I don't want to embarrass her in front of CJ, but I do bookmark the event because I want to follow up on this little moment later at a more appropriate time. So after we go to bed, I said, hey, I just got to ask, what was the whole ducking behind the bar thing? I have a couple of problems. One, if that had been a bad guy breaking into our house, you were just going to leave me out there to fend for myself? Thanks a bunch. And second of all, do you really think that someone is going to break into our house that they don't have enough sense to go, hey, what's behind the bar? I mean, really? <laughs> and she said, no, 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 you don't understand. Right next to the bar, just across the way from the bar, is the drawer full of knives. And if it had been someone dangerous, I was going to go get a knife, and I was going to come out and just, eek, 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 you know, I was just going to work them over. I was thinking of you. Now, you can believe that line about her thinking of me if you want. I find it a little sketchy myself, okay? But can we all agree, agree that Pam was ready to resist the evil one? Oh, yeah, she was. She was ready to go. Peter says, listen, if you want to increase and grow in your humility, you need to resist the evil one. And when I look at that, you know, what in the world is that? How do those things have anything together? How are they in common? Think about the greatest temptations that face you. Think about the one sin that when that temptation comes your way, you just cave in. I mean, you fold like a lousy hand of cards that thing's got your number. Think about that sin for a moment. And as you think about that sin, I don't know about you, but when I think about my sin that's that way, if I'm not at my very best spiritually, if I'm not at the top of my game spiritually, I'm going to get blown out of the water by that temptation. You know what I'm talking about? If I'm going to succeed in dealing with that temptation, I need to be in the Word I need to be prayed up. I need to be accountable to other believers. I need to be worshiping. I need to be hearing the word. I need, I need every asset that I can get. I know if I'm going to come up against that temptation, if I'm going to be put into the, the position of maybe committing that sin, I had better be game on, right? 
Because otherwise, there's no chance that I'm going to succeed. If I step away from all of those spiritual resources, let me tell you, when I do that kind of battle, I need the tools, right? I need the word. I need the prayer. I need the accountability. I need the Bible study. I need, I need all of that. I need every tool I can get. Otherwise, it's not going to go well for me. And I would submit that you're probably the same way. If you're going to resist the evil one, if you're going to go down that road, you need to understand the evil one who is coming against us is powerful, and he will take you out if you aren't submitted to something greater. As pastor here, I have the unique vantage point of seeing into other people's lives from time to time. They'll come to me, tell me about what's going on. And I've had people come to me, and they'll confess to me. They'll say, you know what, there's this person in my office that I find really attractive. And I'm thinking I could be a whole lot happier with them than I am with my spouse. And I begin to talk with them. And you know what? They're not in church. They're not in the Word. They're not praying. Okay? All of the spiritual tools that they would need to resist that temptation, gone. None of them. And I say to them, what are you thinking here? What's your strategy? Because you're going into the situation where every single day you are seeing and encountering someone that you find to be attractive, that makes you feel special, on and on down the list goes. What is your plan? What's your strategy for successfully resisting the evil one? And they'll say, oh, I, I, I'm okay. I'm going to navigate this thing just fine. I don't, you know, I'm, yeah, I'm not in church right now, but... I'll get back to that. I mean, you know, yeah, I'm not in the Word. I'm not. You know what that makes you? That makes you arrogant. Because you honestly think that you're going to take on the evil one and you don't need a thing. And you're going to be able to navigate that just fine. And what you need to know is that God resists the proud. And your plans, your past, what you think, it's going to fail, and it's going to fail huge. And you're likely to take a lot of people that care about you with you. If you're going to become a person who demonstrates greater humility, if you're going to grow in this area, then you've got to resist the evil one. And that means you've got to understand that you're not nearly big enough or bad enough to handle that on your own. It takes every resource possible and so when I confront that in my life, you know what the outcome of that is? Humility. Because I know I can't do this by myself. And what happens if we really begin to embrace humility? This cool thing occurs. A culture of humility begins to break out around us. That's pretty cool. Think about your home. If you begin to brace humility at home, what starts to happen? A culture of humility begins to break out all around you. And a culture of humility exists in your home. That means that mom and dad can go to the kids and say, you know what, kids? We didn't get that quite right. We'd like to take another run at that. We're sorry. Okay? And that's okay. The kids are able to embrace that. The kids are able to come to the parents and say, you know what? We didn't get that right. We failed. We didn't measure up. We'd like to take another run at that and get that right. A husband can say to his wife, or a wife can say to her husband, I didn't get that right. I know that I need to do this differently. Will you help me get it right? Because I want to honor Christ in this home, and that's a key piece of the puzzle. I want to get that right. What about if it invades your workplace? How cool would that be if there was a culture of humility on the job? And wouldn't it be great if the boss could wake in and walk in and say, you know what, I didn't quite get the timeline on this thing just right. Let's take another run at this thing. Can you all help me? Didn't quite get that right. Can you all come along beside me? Because I know I can't get this project right without your help. And the team looks at their supervisor and says, oh, you got it. We got your back. We're going to make this thing work. You, you count on us, right? Or what about a church? If a culture of humility begins to break out, what happens? Is that everybody realizes that your pastors and your your leadership here in the church, people like Doug and Tommy and Aaron and Warren and Natalie and me, it's real easy to realize, you know what, there are people just like we are. They've got strengths, they've got weaknesses, and hopefully they've got a good, healthy self-assessment of that. 
and they're doing the best they can, and we're going to come together, and we're going to work together, and we're going to make this place amazing. See what happens? Don't you want to be a part of a culture like that at home, at work, at church? I certainly do. I certainly do. And you know how it starts? It starts when each one of us makes a commitment to pursue humility, just like we're called to here in 1 Peter chapter 5. Let's pray together. Father, we love you, and we just give you glory today. We recognize your goodness. We recognize your leadership. We recognize your authority. We know that you're the master of the world, that you're the creator of the universe, and so we come before you today, and we just humbly ask you for help. We know, Lord, that without you, we can do nothing. That's what the Bible tells us. And so, Father, I pray that you will give us the wisdom to humble ourselves before you, to take account daily, to ask ourselves constantly, am I handling this in a way that honors Christ? Am I humble enough to pursue his path, not my own? Father, help us as we interact with other people to reflect to them the very best of humility, to clothe ourselves with it so that even when it's a little uncomfortable, we're making sure that we show the humility of Christ in every interaction. And for those moments where we trip and where we stumble, Father, forgive us. Give us the courage to come to you and to ask and to repent of our sin, to ask for forgiveness and to determine to step out in a new way, in a new boldness with humility. Father, thank you for humbling yourself and taking on the form of a servant when you sent your son Jesus to come and die and pay the penalty for us. Lord, help us understand that being humble and taking that on is a critical piece of what it means to be like Jesus. Thank you, Father, for saving us. Thank you for empowering us to live boldly and differently every single day. And everyone agreed and said, Amen. Amen. You all that stand and worship together.
Well, thanks so much for being here today. I'm delighted that you were. I hope it was a good morning of worship for you. As you get ready to leave, a couple of things I want to call to your attention. Uh, every week, I always remind you to pick up your takeaways. You leave the, the room. This might be the most important takeaway of the year because it includes all the information related to our season of compassion. It's a great time of the year here as we in, are involved in giving and generosity uh, and interacting with our community in just some unique ways. And it all begins next Sunday. Just want to make sure that you're aware of it uh, and that you plan on being here. Don't miss next Sunday morning and don't miss me next Sunday night uh, as we have our prayer time and all of that and deliver all of the food that we've received in and all of that. So be sure to be a part of that. You can still sign up to volunteer uh, for next Sunday night out there. Just going out onto the runway, get more information about the season of compassion out there. And be sure to be a part of it. Also on the runway today, you'll be able to buy tickets for the women's brunch that's coming up in a few weeks. It's an important time of uh, coming together and learning and also generating some resources for a sister ministry here in our community. So be sure to check that out as well. So all of it starts right here with your takeaway. Uh, if we've not had a chance to meet, I would count it a privilege if you'd come and introduce yourself. We'd love to hear from you. If you'd like to talk to me about something we discussed today, again, you'd be most welcome. You all have a great day.